poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, 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 my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. And today's guest on CPG is one of the most popular Twitch streamers in the world and party poker sponsored pro, Jamie Staples. As of this episode's release, Jamie has cash for over $1.5 million in combined online and live poker tournaments with no signs of slowing down anytime soon. Today's conversation with Jamie is going to travel to some uncomfortable territory as we have a frank discussion about invisible suffering hiding in plain sight all around us. Unfortunately, this is an area where your humble podcast host has infinitely more questions than answers, but that doesn't mean it's a topic unworthy of dragging into the light. It does beg some uncomfortable questions, though. Like, if you catch poker greatness, what can you do with it that helps alleviate the suffering of your fellow man? And what do you do if you realize that there are some problems much too big for any one person to tackle alone? Perhaps this conversation will set up a future Philosophical Friday discussion with Duncan on moving beyond a zero-sum game into the realm of gasp, non-zero-sum games, or win-wins. If this intro feels like you're getting set up for something heavy, don't worry too much. We're also going to spend an ample amount of time diving into the wide world of everything poker. And if you happen to miss my earlier episode with Jamie or a very, very early episode with his brother Matt, I'd highly suggest checking out those Greatness Bomb Dripping episodes as soon as you're done listening to this one. Now, without any further ado, I bring to you one of the most thoughtful and noble poker ambassadors in the whole world, Jamie Staples. Mr. Staples, how you doing, man? Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Yeah, having you back. You know, it's it's been a little bit. I, I've been doing well. How about yourself? Things are good, dude. Things are good. Uh, the world is different. I'm fairly similar. Uh, <laughs> poker and streaming and content. Still love this game. That's where I'm at, man. And uh, where are you located these days? I think you, at some point, you moved, but that may have been like over a year ago. Yeah, about a year, year and a half. I was in Scotland when we last spoke in Edinburgh, and now I'm in Montreal, in cold, frozen Montreal. It's been a rough winter. Where, where are you, Brad? <laughs> in the world, I, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. So okay, it's not frozen. Not so cold right now. I think it's uh, it's seventy three degrees outside mm. and blue skies. So, yeah, it, things are quite nice right now. I, I'm not a fan of the cold. I'm not built for the cold. Mm. So I don't envy you right now. It's been really ruthless. Like I'm not even joking around. You know the whole weather small talk thing. Like I'm not. It's been a real struggle for me this winter uh, up here. Like we we had a bad COVID thing and we our COVID. Uh, sort of response was pretty aggressive uh, in Canada relative to a lot of the world. So things were like really shut down. Uh, my fiance was actually in England for two months. So it was like minus 20 for the last three months Celsius, but it's not even then far from Fahrenheit when you get down that low. Um, <laughs> yeah, it'll like, kill you. No and I'm what. alone, you know? And it's just like, dude, this is ruthless. You know, there's no sunlight. It's been a painful, painful geological experience. I was even thinking like, man, can I... Can I do the like two house thing? Like, can I, what, can I make it work where I can s- go somewhere for the winter? Like, do I really have the financial jobs to do that already? Uh, I might do it, man. I don't know. I don't know. I got to make a short list. Well, to get there's, out of Dodge. <laughs> there's a reason why so many people live in Los Angeles. You know, the, the, the joke is uh, about the small talk and the weather, but if weather did it really matter? Then there wouldn't be so many people that live in LA. The traffic wouldn't be so bad. Um, mm. And I know weather certainly affects my outlook, my energy, just really mm. most everything in life. Like when you can have sunlight and it's warm outside, I'm just in such a better mood. I, I have more energy. I feel better. Yes. 
Absolutely. No, I a hundred percent. And the thing is, I, I don't have a lot of options right now because I I'm a poker pro for party poker. So where can I stream that is I'm allowed to stream from in the winter months. And, you know, I could do, I could do like South America, but use some leverage, man. Portugal or something. Yeah. You know? Just get them in Portugal. Be like, guys, get in there. You know, I, I need to move. <laughs> you some of that, you know, honestly, that Jamie... I can pitch that to them and see what they say. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Use your Jamie Staples pool, you know? Yeah. Um, well, what have you been up to since, you know, we just looked it up is June 2020. So just hanging out, streaming, that whole, that whole thing. Anything exciting? Yeah, so a lot of content. Uh, been with Party Poker that whole time and focusing on just trying to share the, the tournaments and online story. And then from a poker side of things, I think I've improved quite a bit at the, the game of poker. Uh, been working pretty hard, been doing some lessons. Um, and just a lot of time, you know, like with, with some technical tools like solvers, but um, also some like quizzing software. And I think taking my game to a level where I'm winning in high stakes tournaments, uh, you know, like 1K tournaments. So that's really fun to, to win at high stakes. I really enjoy that. Um, and sharing that journey in content, you know, like that's, that's kind of been the, the MO for the last couple of years. Um, I see I feel like... You, you pop up in my Instagram somewhat regularly. I see you mm. just getting your soul ripped out of you kind of uh, over and over and over again. Those clips do the best, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> the clips uh, play to the medium uh, poker player, right, which really enjoys the bad beats and the big suckouts <laughs> and the big emotional hands. Um, so, yeah, you're going you're gonna to get a lot of those, a lot of those hands on, on Instagram. A lot of yeah, the it's, it's like... Uh, Super Dave, you know, you just see over and over and over again the Jamie Staples getting fucking smashed. The the yeah. shock on his face, the slack jaw, um, yeah. the, the empty <laughs> the empty stare out into oblivion. Um, <laughs> People love it. They love the pain. They love the pain. Yeah. Um, you were saying something, and I, I interrupted you. If you remember what you were saying, but if you don't remember, then I was going to ask you about. Uh, you know, what, what's been the most impactful thing that you've studied and has helped elevate your game in the past couple of years? Yeah. So I, I remember where I was going, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but it, like there's been a process of this figuring out how to balance a professional poker career and content career and other parts of life and make that sustainable. I'm sure we'll get into some of that later. Um, oh, please help me. I need, I need, I think I need help, yeah. help in this regard. I think I'm in the demographic that wants to have this conversation. <laughs> we were talking about this last time too, but let's, let's talk poker strategy first. All right. Um, all right. So I think, you know, I realized that for the first five or six or seven years of my career, like the biggest downfall was a really solid understanding of uh, different ranges pre-flop in various scenarios because because tournaments are so variable as you know and as you as people listening to this know like 20 blinds is different than 15 blinds is different than 30 blinds is different than 40 than 60 than 80 and not and the stacks aren't all equal they're variable so it's not like cash games where everyone's got 100 it's like you've got someone with 20 behind and then someone with 40 and then the big you know, the big stack of the tournament is in the big blind. And like yeah, the, all of that just changes everything, you know? Yeah. The configuration of what, like who has the chips um, yeah. relative to where you are, how many chips you have. Like there's, yeah, that's what makes tournaments so tough are, mm -hmm. is managing and finding the right variables to prioritize in your decision making. Yeah. Well, you know, pre flop on the button versus like cut off or something, you know, this is like very, very mixed strategy of three betting at a hundred blinds. And then it starts to like really go to, um, you know, sort of like polarize a little bit in the forties. And then you drop some of these hands and then you add some of these and then you get shorter. And then it goes back to the ASEX suiteds and like, it, it just all this stuff fluctuates and how to deal with three bets and four bets. It's a massive, massive game, preflop tournament poker. So I've been able to use um, some stuff with raise your edge and paired. But so go through that and I'd quiz a lot and learn 
of all these ranges. I just got them down really pat and I don't know, plugged like a ton of leaks, like improved my win rate hugely just from not being in stupid spots. Cause my ranges were like completely out of whack post flop. And that is a really boring experience. It's not fun <laughs> to study pre-flop ranges and like drill them and like guess and check, but it helped a ton, you know? Yes. Um, it, that's, you know, the first product that I came out with was preflop bootcamp and it is not sexy by any stretch of the imagination, yeah. but it is fundamental and foundational and high frequency. And like mm. all of those things are just worth their weight in gold when it comes to studying and, and improving your poker game. I agree. I mean, what, like what's more important, like, um, like a range construction on like how much of your range wants to better check on the flop and you miss it by 20% or like your range being 6% too wide or too narrow pre-flop. It's like the pre-flop makes a bigger difference, you know, in, in your win rate. Uh, and it makes your life so much easier when you know immediately like what it looks like. So yes, you uh, have bandwidth, right? Yeah. Again, something that I talk a lot about It's it's a thing that like you can tell people about, but until they like, really experience it, then that's when it kind of sets in mm. and you're like, oh, like we were talking about all the variables and like how things can change based on stack sizes, table configuration, all these things. Well, when you know what your strat is supposed to be and it's re just a reflex, then you can start thinking about the additional variables on top of, you know, what the range should be and come to a much better conclusion. Um, and in the, yeah. in the cash game sense, like when you know what to do pre-flop, well, now you freed up so much mental bandwidth to think about post-flop um, that you just make better decisions and you go deeper and you learn more. It's just a cumulative it, effect. It makes so much sense why you guys are so good at like post-flop because I've been doing a little bit of cash game study recently. And I mean, the pre-flop game relative to MTTs is like, doable bro like you can learn the game mm -hmm. <laughs> like the pre-flop game and in like a month of like steady sort of practice and work like you'll know kind of how it works um and you just can't do that in mtts so so it makes sense like you cash guys get that down and then it's you can deviate from that when it makes sense right and like and then you're just crushing me on on flop range construction where i'm just like dude i haven't got this far yet I'm yeah, like hold, like, on, hold on different <laughs> you know <laughs> like, you know a equity shifting turns and rivers and like yeah. multi-way spots i mean i just got back uh from a tournament the first i've played three live tournaments in the last 10 years if that gives you any uh picture of how often i'm battling in the tournament scene right but what I realized was, A, I have no idea what to do with 25 bigs or 30 bigs. I am just, like, <laughs> lost. But, B, like, the really skillful and good tournament players, when they get to, like, a turn, <laughs> like, yeah. the wheels just kind of fall off. You know, their, their ability to play, like, after the flop was uh, subpar you know, which mm -hmm. may not be super detrimental in tournaments, but like it was, it was something that I picked up on quite quickly was like, okay, I need to get myself in more post-flop situations because, you know, people are just kind of torching. Um, and that was, yeah, part of my game plan. Um, and ironically I, I busted out in a post-flop situation because right. one of the worst, one of the calibrations I didn't make was in cash games, um people bluff a lot and i think in tournaments the pressure gets to people and yes, bluff yeah. catching the value of bluff catching goes down in spots that are just like slam dunk easy calls in cash become quite easy folds in tournaments and i think there were just a, a few like ace high bluff catches that <laughs> uh probably are aren't going to make money in a tournament setting that are like kind of printing in a, in, in, in a cash game setting. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And you know, the other thing that I think along those same lines is with antis, like ranges just get out of whack comparative to cash game ranges where they're pretty like tight. So it's, it's much easier to visualize without antis, what people's ranges are pre-flop and post-flop, but it's like an MTT's, you know, like button versus big blind. 
people have so many choices of hands to bluff with because the ranges are so wide, 20 blinds deep. Like there's no reverse implied odds. People just get to check raise like every pair if they want. But like even in a in a game theory sense, like they can just check raise like second pair or better all in because it doesn't matter on a lot of board textures, you know, like there's just a lot of money in the pot. So, so you have these situations where ranges are really wide and it's so easy to get out of whack. Like I think for a long time, it was just C-bet 85% of range on every board texture and then just check turn, you know, like, <laughs> like NPC players yes. would just like bet turn 20% of the time or something like that. Right. Right. And, and it was and- just like these huge holes were developed. You know? Yeah, and, and because like there's no, uh, <laughs> because the incentive in tournaments, or from what I've seen in tournament play for many players, is to protect their equity in the pot. Um, mm-hmm. Actions become much more honest, and so you know they bet the flop, like they see bet the flop, like you said, eighty percent of the time, and then they check the turn, which means they're going to overfold the turn by not a small measure. Right, like massively, mm-hmm. massively overfolding, and massively, massively over c betting the flop as well. So, like that fifteen percent when they check back on the flop, well, then you just stab the turn, and they're likely overfolding in that situation as well. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, that's just maybe it's just an element of, of tournament poker. I assume that like as you venture into like the realm uh, of high stakes tournaments and you're battling against consistently strong competition um things have to shift you you have to they're good yeah yeah you have to understand the full game tree Mm -hmm. um but yeah Yeah. like it doesn't it it doesn't exist like that forever i mean in a cash guys yeah in a cash game sense it's almost like playing the blinds like small blind versus big blind and big blind versus small blind you know is the loosest formation and you're raising a lot of hands like some like half the combos you know like five 600 mm-hmm. combos or so and like in a in a tournament setting if you're raising the button with all the annies you're raising that many combos and then like you have to manage all these combos post flop and that is not a small task to do like not easy no it is not easy at all like the wider you are the harder it is to manage everything in a way that makes you not exploitable and, and most people i would venture to say almost every person is exploitable in some way yeah yeah no absolutely it it's it's a hard thing to do and i mean i think the guys at the top you know you'll often often see them playing like 500 fast forward or 500 zoom on the side like i think they've they've got some chops and you know i'm not suggesting in like the 500s or 1ks online that people are under bluffing turns they're no, probably no, no, over no. bluffing turns because they know that people are, you know, exploitable, right? Like right. they're they're great, but a lot of these leaks, I think, developed over just the history of of like online poker, like just the trends of the day, the exploitability of just like, oh yeah, raise C bet and people overfold flops, so you just C bet your range because that's what wins, and we can prove that based on this math. Like you, this works this much, and that's great. And someone's like, well, wait a second, did we compare that? So like, if we check, like how profitable is the turn line? You know, card runners EV when it came out and everyone's like, whoa, we can't see that hundred percent of flops. You know, it's just like this, this, inter- this progression of, of learning. So I feel like a lot of tournament culture isn't inherent to the game or the structure of the game or how it's set up. It's just culture that's developed from these thought processes over time, you know, and people are stuck yeah. at various aspects of it. And they're, you know, I'm sure I have plenty in my game where I've got some line of logic that's based on some idea from a card runners or a deuces crack video from like, you know, 2008. <laughs> from, uh, <laughs> a billion like, years ago. Exactly, dude. Yeah, 100%. In the past year, I think one of my missions has been to really try to understand poker at like a basic level of how do you quantify a value bet? what is happening when you raise what is happening when you bet like what makes for a successful bluff um just how does the game work uh like if i were to build a solver how would i build a solver right like how would i go Mm -hmm. about creating an algorithm and programming it um to really just understand what's going on and I, i think in tournament poker like they're these just like kind of heuristics come out of like always be raising or betting never be calling or checking right and and it's like well 
you just eliminated tools that have utility from like the jump. And I think the reason why people latch on to these is because, um, yeah, just somebody told them. <laughs> like that's yeah, that's really yeah, it. Yeah. Somebody just told them that, and then they just accepted it, and then they just moved on. Um, but really, when you understand like what's happening in poker, it makes your decision making process like it adds depth there because it's like, wait a minute, like I have aces, and the flop is like deuce, deuce, eight. Like, do I want to see bet this hand every time? And what am I accomplishing? Like, how many bets do I want to play this hand for? How many bets are left? And then, like, where does the value of the bets come from? Because bets that go in different ways are worth different amounts. Like, a bet that goes in when somebody is betting um, is worth more than a bet that goes in when somebody is calling. Because when somebody bets, they can have bluffs and low equity hands. And so, yeah, just kind of like looking at these fundamental concepts of what's going on in poker um, are, is extremely helpful in the sense that I got from, you know, my one silly live tournament and just hearing people speak and talk about the game is that it's kind of like just monkey see monkey do type thing uh, and not really understanding what you're accomplishing by, you know, see betting the flop, for instance, right. That was the one right. that we talked about before. Um, and I, I train my guys too, by the way, when it's like a range C bet, it's mm -hmm. like range C bet is basically a post flop blind. It's taking your preflop right. range and just putting money out there in the mm -hmm. dark, right? And if you have a very wide preflop range, then the player who's defending should be check raising the bejesus out of this blind bet, right? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. No, absolutely. It's it's just like that that flop situation. Still to this day, is such a complex mind thing to navigate you know like like the deuce deuce eight for example i don't know what your process is and i might expose my my fishy tournament process but like i think about okay how does my range interact with this board and then i think about how does their range interact with this board right and then i think about what do i think i want to do with my range and those are already very complicated you got to visualize very complicated questions and then i get granular and I'm like, okay, where this hand is in my range, if it's not a range bet, you know, is this like, do I think I want to take the high frequency like bet or check, you know, like an example of we bet two thirds and we check one third and I have aces on that board or something like that. Do I want to check with the aces or do I want to bet with the aces? Right. So like that, those are basically the four steps I go through mm -hmm. on a board and, uh, damn that it's just hard, bro. Like, to, like Poker has so much nuance when you're trying to play at a high level and you can come up with these tournament heuristics, like you said, these rules that simplify it, but they're not, they're not good enough to compete at the highest levels. You know, like you just get more and more granular to where you're thinking about, is it better to have the backdoor flush draw blocked or unblocked on the turn? And you're just yeah. like, Oh my God, what are we talking about here? <laughs> you know, like this is ridiculous. Right. Um, and that's the game. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. And I would say one, one thing to that I would add from like the cash game sense is that something I learned or something that just kind of came to me one day was like when considering, you know, range versus range, this is a mistake that people will make a ton in coaching sessions where it's like my range wants to bet this board, you know, like king seven deuce and they have jacks and they're like, I have a lot of kings in my range, so I'm betting, right? And my response is, well, any hand that you're playing that's in front of you is in your range, right? And all the hands in your range want to take multiple paths just because uh, that's how the game works. You know, some hands want to check back, some hands want to bet, some hands, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Some hands want to use a small sizing, some hands want to use a big sizing. Um, and so really it's, it's finding this hand that's in your range and the natural path that it's incentivized to take um makes things much easier where it's like that situation i just said you know king seven deuce well yeah your range has a lot of kings in it but that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to bet with jacks because the hand that you have is jacks <laughs> mm, <laughs> and, and yeah. like you, you know what i mean it, it's just one hand that is makes up your entire range um so that's something that, like i try to try to coach my guys up 
with um, just the concept that like if a hand is in front of you, then it is obviously in your range because if it weren't in your range, then you wouldn't be playing that hand <laughs> yeah, right now. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know what absolutely. I mean? Yeah. Um, so anyway, but yeah, like the thoughts of all of these sort of like, and let's be real, like they're abstract concepts, you know, mm-hmm. like what is, because we work under the assumption that like, how, how does my opponent's range interact with this board? Well, like a hand that I played recently, like I opened under the gun with ace 10, the small blind called, the flop was four, four deuce. It went check, check. The turn was like a six. They bet I called. The river was a queen. They bet I called down with ace high. And they had the 10, four of hearts. And like, I can say <laughs> range versus range. Like how does my opponent's range interact with this board? But I would not have given them the 10, four of hearts in my estimation of their range. So like, right. you know, even that can be challenging or basically just impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, unless it's like a, a player is playing at a very high level and like you kind of know what they're studying and the paradigm that they're working from when it, that's not the case. Um, I just find estimating people's ranges to be just like a futile endeavor of like, yeah, I, th- I think they, I, I don't think any bluffs make sense here, but I know it's an over bluff spot. And when I call, they show up with a bunch of random shit. And so therefore I just call and, you know, hope, hope for the best. Um, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I call that the WTF factor, which is just like in every hand, in every spot, there's just always a chance they're doing something that isn't rational. And like, oh my God, you know, yes. at the small stakes, you've got an 8% WTF factor in every hand, you know, you get, you can justify a lot of stuff because it's just like, well, people do weird stuff. I've you know, ha- yeah, like, that makes sense. I've so. studied so many different like range breakdowns and done so much data analysis, and I've yet to find any spot. You know, the classic line of like they never bluff. I've never found any spot where they never bluff. They always mm-hmm. have some air or ace high or small pair component to their strategy. Doesn't yep. mean it's enough to call for like pot odd reasons, but. They always have a bluff. I've yet to look at a spot where it's like just a hundred percent value. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that would be a bad game plan if everyone had a hundred percent value in a spot. It wouldn't be a very good approach uh, to, to poker unless they were, you know, of course, exploiting. You know, right. I think it's that's just, right. You know, like the point is not to always be correct; it's to most of the time be correct. You yeah, know? do the best uh, that you can with the information you have, and that's mm-hmm. all you have. The rest you just have to kind of set to the side and realize. This is a game with incomplete information and like yeah. you do the best you can and move on. And that's really all you can do. Every fold you make, you're getting owned some percentage of the time, you know, and, and sometimes you're getting owned like a third of the time at worst. And then sometimes, you know, you're only getting owned like 1% of the time, but, but it's painful. You know? Like when you make that hero fold, um, yeah. you know, but that's, that's a, that's a tournament leak too, where people, you know, people overcall, people want to see. Like, like trying to get people to make hero folds. You need just to doesn't work until you get the high stakes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't yeah. you can't half ass it. You can't decide on the turn. Like you you need to be fully mm. ready to empty the clip. Uh, yeah. I found two two pot size bets don't get it done. If you're gonna start on the turn, you need an over bet quickly. Yeah, <laughs> and we need to be threatening don't. stacks. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's how it goes. Um, so now we can circle back to, uh, actually where we're, I don't even know where we were in, in the discussion, the tangent that, that we just went on. Um, but learning and growing, uh, about poker, we talked about your thought process. Um, I know that you had, a some very strong words for real time assistance and people selling them like in discord servers. I was going to touch on that since. I would assume that's yeah. a pretty uh, passionate topic of yours. Yeah, so I, I think we've seen um, sort of tools come up over the years that people could use in real time. I think specifically charts is one of those that in tournaments, you know, if we look back to 10 years ago in online poker, it wasn't even prohibited because charts were very basic. It was just like, Default raising ranges and none of the terms of service had it against the rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the last six or seven years, with tools like Monker Solver and like these really powerful programs, we've been able to essentially solve 
uh, preflop poker to a game theory optimal sort of place. It doesn't always mean the right decision to make, but like if robots were playing against each other, they could play optimally against each other. Preflop. And so that's a huge problem for tournaments. Like you can't be, you can't have the preflop game solved and utilize that information. I mean, it just completely takes the enjoyment out of poker. So first thing is, I think Party Poker, the, the company I'm sponsored by, definitely has a handle on stuff like this and has a good game integrity department and is able to do some really smart things that I can't obviously talk about to sort of catch people that might be doing this stuff. But I also trust the other regulated sites to be on top of this. And I think they are on top of this. But they're um, incentivized to be so. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, no one wants to play against someone that has perfect preflop solutions that they're utilizing. But then the second thing, which is so annoying, is I've seen this shift uh, in culture. And most of it originates in, in the US for better or worse. Um, and that's, I mean, it's not shots fired at the country as a whole, but like it seems to have taken route in some of the online US player uh, space where people are sort of justifying the use of this real time assistance and this chart, these charting tools, right? Uh, and these tools that are even looking up post-flop simulations um, to get answers. And people kind of shrug it off as like, ah, well, other people are doing it, so it's not a big deal. And I kind of just wish they would uninstall and uh, go do something else, you know? Like, it's just completely indefensible to me and ridiculous as an idea. Um, so, I mean, sites are on it, and they're they're working on it. Right. And they always got to play catch up, but it's on the poker community to be very clear that like, Hey, the shit is not okay. Like, like you can't just be apathetic about it. Like, Oh, I heard someone else did it. So I'm going to do it. Cause like, they're probably doing it. Like, no, no, that's not how it works. You know, it's a very clear cut line in ethics in poker. And this is very clearly on the wrong side of things. So, uh, I think yeah, I just feel serious about that. I mean, a, as you should, right? Because, and, and, you know, the, the poker platforms is kind of like an existential threat to them, like, just in general, is like you don't want your games to become RTA infested because then who's going to play, first of all? And mm. once once the consumer loses trust in your brand and your platform, then you're just toast. Um, so they're incentivized heavily to catch RTA and this sort of thing. Um, on I, I think... There's a weird component to it too, and I understand the incentive of RTA in that people think they can just make money by running this program. Um, I, I would argue that they, people who are using it probably are not aware of the swingy nature of using it in the first place. And so like they, there's obviously, they can get whacked just by variance and by mm. people putting them in situations that haven't been covered and so when you think about like, you need a bankroll to do this, right? Like effectively you, you need to be in action somehow. So like maybe that's some kind of natural deterrent, like a uh, risk aversion from that side. And also like people should just be turning people in. Uh, I mean, because it's not, it's not the point of poker. It's not fulfilling. There's no growth. There's no learning. It's lazy. And mm -hmm meaningless and i mean to me it's just kind of pointless like why not just go do something else like scam something else or like get into algorithmic trading or you know whatever it is that you want right. to get into but like yeah so anyway uh, not only do i not see not only do i believe that it's awful but i it also just i don't see the appeal it doesn't make sense to me no i like i'm with you too i feel I've thought about that in the past. And then I always play devil's advocate with myself in terms of, well, if I wasn't a poker pro and I saw the ability to make money, like maybe I would struggle to understand that reasoning of like, what's the point, but that's, I feel the same way, which is like, I wouldn't play this game if I wasn't competing. Like if you just gave me the, if you gave me the classic superhero thing where I could see the hand, would I play? Like, no dude, like I don't, I got enough money to be happy. Like I wouldn't play where I could see the cards. What's the point? There's no point left. Like, okay, you've got an unlimited money hack. Congrats. You know, like, yeah. so I, I understand people's pushback, but it's, 
you hear things all the time. The problem I find is they're unsubstantiated. And for me as a sponsored pro and a representative, I can't just be firing unsubstantiated shots at like, oh, I heard this and this and this. I can't be putting people on blast like that because I think their integrity is important and I need some sort of like proof, um, you know, but people bring things to me with proof. You know, I pass it along to party poker and say, Hey, you heard this, here's the thing and take a look. So, yeah. I mean, in this way, I think poker has always been a community that is uh, like, we've, we've kind of policed things ourselves for better or worse, just like mm. over time. And um, yeah, like even, an issue such as botting, right? If you think of the incentives of the platform that has a major bot problem, mm -hmm. uh, it's not always advantageous to get a handle on it if those bots are generating lots of revenue collectively, yeah. right? The, the platform's kind of incentivized to kind of look the other way, honestly. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, absolutely. I, I think there's a few, I mean, the RTA is, is a big deal. I think bots is obvious, but I feel like probably the easiest the catch of, of all the things uh, that I could think of. I think some people get around RTA in terms of like, oh, I'm just learning. So I don't use it when I'm playing, but then I look up what I did after. It's like, well, that's also an unfair advantage. You know how, how nice it would be to be able to play and to learn your mistakes immediately with immediate feedback. Like, like that's a great advantage to, actually, be, to check, guess and check yourself while you play. Like you can't do that. You know? I, I actually, would have agreed with you a few months ago, but now mm. I think I disagree with you because what I found out from starting my CFP was that like when people are trying to learn and play at the same time, you know, it, where they're like playing and then, you know, in a session and like try to learn and try to like look at their mistakes, like directly after whatever it is like, or I mean, in some cases uh, I'm sure people look things up in real time, right? Which is like not a, a difficult thing to police like directly afterwards. But what I found is that like you can't perform and learn at the same time. And anybody that uses RTA actually, where they can look up the answer, um, it's not going to be sticky. There's no need for it to stick in their memory bank because they can just look it up. And mm. so they actually become worse at, you know, a, a good example is like preflop charts. If you don't invest the energy, to committing preflop charts and cash games to your long-term memory and you look them up at every decision point, well, you get distracted and you don't learn what the ranges are because there's no pressure to recall the information because you just have it readily available. Um, right. So like even somebody saying that they use it to learn to me is kind of bullshit because like you're not learning because why would you? You don't, there's no need because you could just look it up right then. You, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, I hear you. I hear um, you. And learning is supposed to be hard, by the way. This is another thing that I've I've learned. Uh, it is like learning should be challenging. It should feel like you're just about to die and you can't take any more. <laughs> yeah, that's how that's how you know that when you're you're doing it right. Um, yeah, from a learning standpoint. Yeah, um, going through the pain. I I think the one that I just just want to say one last piece on the one that is the most egregious to me. And I don't have sort of substantiated claims on this, like with evidence, but I've heard stories of people and that's multi-accounting. And that to me is, I mean, the lowest of the low, right? I don't have any breaking news tea to drop on you in terms of who it is, but you know, I've heard of substantial people multi-accounting in, in online poker tournaments to where they have card sharing information and like that stuff is just makes me sick, you know, like if you're any level of accomplished player and you participate in stuff like that, I mean, worse is than it, dirt to me. Is it more for like card sharing or is it the ability to have like multiple entries into a single, Both. single tournament? Both. But if, you know, if it's a high roller, small field tournament, well, yeah. there's value, right? There is. I mean, so. this is again, the world of tournaments is not, not my world, but mm -hmm. I am fairly confident that it's a thing that happens more regularly than you might think, than the listener might think by people that they probably are very familiar with. Yeah. I mean, there's big, there's big games out there that aren't 
that aren't clean, you know, big names that get covered in poker news that, that are doing shady things and, and are all about the dollar. And I mean, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. It's pretty easy to be just negative about all this. I, like I said, I think the integrity part departments, not just at party poker, but at stars at GG of these regulated sites that are competitors to us. They're real sharp teams with like real powerful tools. And this is all they do. So like they're on it. They're better than both of us at figuring this stuff out. Thank God. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And hopefully there's like real consequences. Like I, I've always thought that like poker being unregulated, like in the U S like mm. there's very minimal consequences or downside to whatever you do. Right. But like yeah. if they're, if you're banned for life from a platform that is quite profitable to play on, and th then that's a huge deterrent, right? If mm -hmm. somehow people get sued or there's criminal charges and there's like, you have to play, pay restitution or penalties. I mean, these are real life consequences that will deter people from these sorts of actions. And so maybe one day down the line, that'll like be a thing where it's like, oh, you are caught using RTA. There's a, a criminal penalty and you know you have to deal with that yeah. Um, downside, which obviously will disincentivize folks from, from going that route. It would, it would be nice if there was some sort of cooperation between sites and between, between departments. I don't feel as if that's in place and, or it will happen in the short term, but yeah. Cause I feel like there isn't wide held consequences to these, to these things right now, uh, well, which is such a shame, you know, it is a shame and information I think should be shared and I think obviously like there's room for whatever, you know, there, there's room for like uh, sites being incentivized, you know, for somebody, you know, stars to be like, ah, oh, yeah, we call it Staples multi-accounting. Um, they, they can't though, because of the European laws with, with privacy, they can't mm -hmm. share with other companies. Ah, uh, so it's a privacy law. It's not that they don't, mm -hmm. that site platforms don't want to communicate. It's that they can't communicate. Well, they definitely can't. And also, I don't know if they want to, but they can't <laughs> under the new EU laws, uh, yeah. like share that information or with the, or the community. Right. Yeah. So like, I, I mean, part, I would party's love like, to party's get like, one like, of the Fuck you guys. Guys. Jamie's yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to get one of the security guys, you know, on a night out or something like that and just try <laughs> and get some stories. Cause you've got to know they have a treasure trove of dirt on the poker world and they just can't, you know, it's like the law. They can't be talking about that stuff. They can't release that information. So. Stupid privacy. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Um. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the decision to enter a hand is fundamental to poker strategy. Too tight, and they know what you have. Too loose, and you're easy to run over. Free Flop Bootcamp from Chasing Poker Greatness is a comprehensive guide to locking down your preflop game and creating true range advantage. Eight days of guided training, over 60 optimal ranges, and access to a dedicated community of players that will push your preflop game from a place of weakness to your greatest strength. Go to chasingpokergreatness.com slash bootcamp. Available now. John, I wanted to ask you why you decided to invest in a preflop bootcamp. Everything that you had done with me to that point, or I had heard you do, had impressed me. I loved the podcast. I accidentally ended up in the poker power hour and loved that. And then I took coaching and then you recommended the boot camp. And at first I didn't think it was, you know, something that would be that valuable. But I was like, everything else has been amazing. So I signed up and then it just blew me away. And what about boot camp blew you away? Like it started off slow. Like I'm learning these ranges and I'm not even understanding what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, as I start to understand what we're doing with the three bets, the four bets, all of a sudden it just kind of hit me. And I was like, oh my God, how do I not know this stuff? This is amazing. The more I studied them, I started to understand why they were constructed sometimes. Like I'd be like, that's why that's like that. And that would lead to more revelations and just a better understanding of poker in general. 
Do you have any interesting takeaways from your boot camp experience? The most interesting thing about the boot camp, it's a pre-flop boot camp, but I feel like it's done as much for my post game as it did for my pre-game, just because I'm not in as many awkward and bad situations as I found myself in. You know, when we were doing coaching before the boot camp, we couldn't get through 10, 15 minutes of tape without finding mistake after mistake. And then once we did the boot camp, it solved problems on the back end as well. I know you've studied for a thousand hours this year. How do you think boot camp compares to your other poker study? Oh, it's crazy. The boot camp is probably the most important thing I've done all year out of everything. I would give anything to go back and to, to know that stuff 10 years ago. I can't imagine how successful I'd be right now if I had known that stuff. And I thought the boot camp was so valuable that I literally insisted you take more money from me and paid you more for the boot camp because I was blown away. I just thought the price was too cheap. And it's changed my game in ways that I, I can't even explain to you. If you'd like to join the next round of Preflop Boot Camp, which starts on the last Saturday of every month, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp to lock up your spot. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp. Uh, So let's go to living your life as uh, a poker player and, you know, actually living your life, not playing poker as just a regular human being out into the world. Um, What is going on in in that area in your life? Yeah, there's a lot. uh, I'm doing a lot of stuff on the side of poker and content. And I feel like last time we talked, we sort of talked about this whole thing a little bit, uh, but I've been through the sort of process since. And when I looked at poker and when I looked at content creating in general, it's just, it's like burnout epidemic. Like people are, their career and their time in the game is so fleeting. And that's not just true in poker and it's not just true in like streaming or YouTube, but it's just true broadly in that like careers are shorter and people are like, doing things till they absolutely hate it and then quitting and doing something else. Right. And I didn't understand why I would want to, why I'd I'd want to set my life up that way. First of all, it seemed like not the most profitable, right? Like being a sponsored pro and creating content over 15 years and making it sustainable made a lot more sense than being like number one for three years and then wanting to never touch the game again. Right. Like that's Mm -hmm. it. It, I'd make less money and it'd be less enjoyable. So a lot of it has been figuring out how to sustain uh, playing poker at a high level, creating content at a volume to where I retain relevancy and I'm valuable to partners. And then also having a life where I get to do valuable and interesting things and like pursue other hobbies, other business projects. Um, and that's been like the last three or four years is figuring that out. And and I think I've succeeded in Structuring that to where I don't feel overwhelmed, but I'm able to balance doing four or five things and doing them well, I think. So tell me about the structure, how, you know, what that structure looks like. Sure. So I sort of have like a North Star in terms of things that I'm, that are important to me right now. So like my fiance and health and then poker and content and and business or whatever. Right. So I'll, I'll kind of have an idea of that. And I've just gotten a lot better at structuring the things that I have to do in a day. Um, I had a tweet thread the other day in terms of how I sussed through like all of my to-do lists. Um, And I guess from a a mental perspective, I don't really beat myself up over the amount of time I put in or I don't put any expectations on myself in terms of what I need to accomplish. It's mostly like at the beginning of every day and at the beginning of every week, what is it that I think is most important to work on? How much can I do? And then I do that and that's it. So functionally, that means as I play poker Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I create content out of that poker and then Monday if I have day twos. And that's, you know, sort of churned into like 25 pieces of content for across the internet, which gets put out. Um, Did I watch it? 
Thank you. Yeah, you watch my bad beats on Instagram. Thanks for that. <laughs> How's Jamie going to get fucked today? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I study poker mostly Monday to Thursday. And then I keep on top of business administration stuff Monday and Tuesday. Um, and then I collaborate with, I think, about four projects right now that are outside of poker in various ways, helping with marketing and or um, just sort of like making decisions for those companies. Um, that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And have like Wednesday and Thursday that are pretty relaxed and chill, do some podcasts, play some video games, hang, hang out with my fiance. Um, and that's it. So it's like 22 year old Jamie would be freaking out. He'd be beating himself up that like everything sucked and you're not doing enough. And like, you know, would, would be panicking at the amount of shit going on. Well, but yeah, it's working well. Yeah. We don't, we can only do so many things in our lifetime. And I think a lot of growing up is just kind of realizing that like, okay, you do the best you can and that's all you can do. And you, we just kind of move on and, and we need time to recover and we need time to rest and we need time mm. to pursue other things that are outside of, you know, the main thing that we spend our time doing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, um, one thing that I, yeah, I wanted to ask you about was uh, the last time you and I talked, you know, we talked about uh, this, uh, this coaching thing um, project that, you know, you were, I guess, lightly involved with at the time. And I noticed you put up a video on like Facebook and just talking about the platform, right. And saying mm -hmm. like, Hey, I like this. I think it's a great idea. If you guys wanted to join, then join. And if you don't, don't, I mean, that's was basically the gist of it. And you got so much heat for mm -hmm. even suggesting that somebody spend money doing a thing. It was like unbelievable to me. Like it, it was, it was like outlandish. Like really? Like he's charging like $3 a month to ask like a question. Uh, and people are like outraged by this. Um, and I can't, I, I can't imagine that if there was so much outrage over something that small, that that isn't, you know, an insignificant uh, portion of energy sent your way is that sort of outrage. And like, how do you deal with that? You know, I, I noticed back then you replied to some of them and then I was just like, mm. this is just out of control. Like, I don't, <laughs> yeah. how does, how does the kid sleep at night? Like, this is just crazy. Um, I, like, I just don't really put any respect on a lot of that stuff. You know, like uh, I think they're the things that are most painful are when like, very reasonable people you know are reasonable have legitimate gripes and they're not usually mean they're just like uh i disagree with you because i think this and this and this and like those are the most impactful the ones that most make you question but sure. you know if some anon says lol not worth it it's like um at some point <laughs> if, you, if you're communicating on the internet like on twitch and youtube and facebook like I'm probably connecting with a hundred thousand people a week in some way, right? Mm -hmm. And they're not all engaging, but take a sampling of a hundred thousand of the population. There's going to be a thousand of them that are in crisis, that are in pain, that are dealing with mental health diff difficulties, and or just like are mean or rude or had something tragic happen, and or just don't like me, you know. But so it's unavoidable, you know. Like if you go to a sporting event. There's going it, to be bad fans. You know, it's just the way it is. It is the yeah. way that it is. And mm -hmm. I'm smiling because, yeah, within any percentage of, of a group that, that is large, you will get those people. But it still hurts at, at some level. You know, it still like stings when you, mm -hmm. you're trying to do something good and then you get pushback that is just like really weird. It's like you have any number of targets to shoot at in the world and mm -hmm. you're choosing me <laughs> like uh, it's just kind of like a i, I guess a, a good example is like um a friend of mine started a, a new training platform um selling his course and, and like we were talking about it and he showed me an email that somebody sent him that was just like uh it was just the worst and we talked about it and we talked about dealing with that sort of thing and 
you know, I got to think about it afterwards and I realized there must be a hundred or 50 emails that were grateful and happy. Right. But the one that he showed mm. me was mm. this awful one, right? Because right. Well, humans have this negativity bias. And so, yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying and you've been in the game a long time. I have to imagine that there was a uh, sort of a transition in dealing with that sort of thing. Definitely. Yeah. Wasn't immediate. No, no. It, like it, it's a skill set you develop. I remember actually a streamer saying that I was bad on stream. I remember crying. This was like right at the start of my stream. I was crying because it's just painful. Like they were announcing to 700 people. They thought I sucked at poker. And it's like, I was streaming and having to deal with people saying, Hey, they say you suck at poker. I just never experienced that. Like, I don't know. I'd never talked to 700 people before <laughs> yeah. people shouting at you saying you suck. Like it just takes a second to feel that, I guess. Yeah, it um, does. But I don't know, man, like when you're streaming, people have poker advice for you. You know, you're, you're firing one case. You've been doing this for a long time. And like, you know, your $11 tournament player comes in and like, oh, that was terrible because they're on some 2009 shit, you know? And it's, I approach it the same way, which is like, hey, they might be right. Okay. But I don't know if they're right. And the best way for me to figure out if, if they're right is to talk to the people I know are experts. Right. So on my stream, I don't listen to any poker advice. I don't put any respect on it. And it's not because they couldn't be right. It's because I can go to Ben CB and I can ask him, <laughs> I can ask pads. I can ask Sam Grafton. Like I can send a text and get answers from the best in the game. So like, why would I take this on? It, it's just, I, there's, I put no respect on it. I don't, it, brushes past me it's the yeah. same thing with negativity dude like i just it doesn't register i'm like ah that probably probably having a tough time is the first thought as opposed to they might be right like i just don't well <laughs> I don't even entertain it neither one of those <laughs> thoughts are my first thought in general what's your what's your first thought <laughs> go fuck yourself that's my first thought like that's that's the first thing that goes goes into my head yeah um and, and i actually try to use I try to use any sort of criticism as fuel for the projects that I'm working on. It's like, you mm. know, yeah, you, you think poker coaching is like a joke? Okay, we'll we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to show you that like we can turn, um, you know, break even players into fucking smashers, and that there's just a lot to be gained by investing into the things that I create. And so like, for me, it's just a driver to my audience, to my customers, to my people to create shit that is ultra impactful. Um, yeah. where, you know, I can just scoff at whatever thing is said and be like, yeah, well, you're an idiot because you know, whatever the, the thing is that people buy from me is worth 10 X what they pay. So mm. And then just kind of move on. But like, I really like having a chip on my shoulder. I think it's a big driver for uh, my energy and the actions that I take. Yeah. I feel you, man. I feel you. I mean, it's helpful. If you've got it in spots, I think use it. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. I lost that in poker though. I just, I've been so, so used to being the fish in the light, in the public light. Like really at the beginning of my career, Joey Ingram did a lot to sort of like, position me as that in the poker world. Like when I first came out, he would do podcasts weekly being like, what's Jimmy Stapler up to this week? And like <laughs> having on JMO where they basically just rag on me for like 30 minutes, you know, and I'm just some 25 year old kid, like playing $50 tournaments, but I got signed by stars. So like I was their punching bag and a lot of the, poker how did that world feel just like, by the way, just being well, I mean, I hated him for that. I was like, why are you making my life so difficult? I haven't done anything to you. Yeah. You know, I used to listen to your podcast. Like, I'm just trying to put my best foot forward and and share the game of poker. Like, I don't deserve this. Sorry you hate stars, but like, yeah. you know, they're a company and I'm just going to try and represent poker. Um, so I don't know. Like, that, uh, that was not easy to deal with. I, I didn't enjoy being the punching bag for like the new era of poker. Um, but Hey, I got rewarded for it and I went through it and it was fine. Um, but that carries over. Like, I think the hardest part about it and the thing that bothers me the most about what people say is when people make up motivations for the actions that you have that don't match your, your motivations. Like those are the hardest comments I tweeted the other day about something. 
someone's, you know, had a whole discussion with another poker player in terms of like, I was doing it for engagement and it just, it bothered me. Like that one bothered me. It's like, you don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. You're just filling in gaps. That gets to me a little bit, I would say. Yeah. Um, the motivation stuff. You know, he's trying to get a rise or always oh, just trying to make money or always oh, just trying to strike up drama. Like, bro, you don't know me. I'm not on Twitter to get engagement. I don't care. You know, like I don't care about Twitter. Right. I'm here to talk with people. <laughs> I think people just project whatever they want onto whoever they want and sort of mm. just make some weird assumption that they know the situation when the reality is they don't know shit and they're just it's just full on projection. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, I mean, that's a thing. I guess that thing doesn't get to me as much anymore just because I kind of know what my vision is and where my level of integrity lies and what I'm working towards. And so if somebody wants to presume that, then I would assume they're not in my audience and they're probably not going to ever buy anything. And I just, they're not anywhere near uh, my inner circle. So fuck them. Um, Mm -hmm. sort of my, my approach to that. But yeah, the, we, we, the thing is like people get content for free, right? Like people Mm -hmm. watch you on Twitch for free and like you do put out, um, you have a positive benefit into the world that for all intents and purposes, 99% of the time is unpaid. And and like, that's not nothing. And of course, human beings who work really hard to build a brand or build their names um, deserve to be compensated monetarily. Else, how the hell do you think they feed their family. How do you think they eat? How do you think they <laughs> yeah. make it make their way through life? You think they they're just like some like silly monkey that just deserves to do your bidding all the time and you don't shouldn't pay them anything? Like I that that to me is like it's weird that like very intelligent people in the poker space are just like very antagonistic towards anyone selling anything ever. That to me has always mm. been a little bit mystifying how yeah, poker players who are really good at the game don't understand basic economics and business. Yeah. I think, I think misplaced anger often. Right. And I think the anger is really, people have a lot of anger at poker sites, but I, I can't feel the same anger in that we just have no leverage in this relationship as professional poker players. You know, when we have leverage, great, utilize it. Right. If if a site needs to get off the ground and needs some traffic as a poker player, you're providing value. But if you're talking to the giant and you're saying, I want this, and they're saying, Okay, well, we are a business and we want this, like you don't have leverage in that relationship. And that just uh people were really angry at that at the time, but I don't I just don't understand. Um sort of like what utopian universe we're all living in. Like we're playing, uh, basically we're playing capitalism in cards, you know? Like that's what we do for a job is we compete and we exploit. And and then when they see the game above the game, get confused, I I just don't really get it, you know? I, well, I, I'm a pragmatist in that sense. Like, yeah. um, I would say like the whole stars debacle mm. could have been handled better. And should sure. have been handled better. And I do think there were long-term consequences to those decisions that affect stars probably even to this day, business-wise. You know, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, it's still a mark on their business. Like, if if they could go back and change that decision, I'm sure everyone at that company would do that for sure. Like, it was a disaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it, they could have. It didn't even cost them that much money. Like, it wasn't going to cost them much. How many supernova elites were there? Like 650. You know, yeah, and it was like a hundred thousand per per elite or something. Like it was, it was a couple million, but like they're a gaming company. You know, yeah, they're making hundreds of millions. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, so basically, that was just a poor business decision <laughs> that had long, long term yeah. downstream consequences and um, greatly affected a lot of a lot of players uh, just because of the way that it went down. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, as a community, you know, we can kind of vote with our action and vote with our dollars and choose where we play. And while it may seem small, if a thousand or 2000 people stop playing somewhere, that's going to have 
a big impact on most platforms that exist in the world. Yep, hundred percent. And it's well, it's not hard to to switch either. I mean, I've I've been with Party Poker now for a couple of years, and Party Poker has, from my point of view, always done things in favor of players. You know, uh, when it was sort of Pads and and Rob and Tom that were heading the ship on every decision, like it was lower rake and higher rewards and like everything for grinders and people didn't come over. And I just, I don't really understand like why, you know, like why wouldn't you play here when everything's better for you? And it's the same, it's poker. Like people are really sticky for some reason. And I feel like poker players should be better at that. They just don't like the way it looks. (laughs) It's like, it's just this comfortability issue of like the software looks different. And there's this, fear of changing and like humans are just very resistant to change why bro like i'm i'm that way with the venetian i mean shots (laughs) fired but like sheldon adelson the biggest lobby against getting poker in the u.s and he's died now so i don't know how my venetian stance is but i haven't played poker i think i've played poker once there and that was before black friday and i haven't spent a dollar there since because i'm just like bro like what I could go anywhere in Vegas. Like, why would I give money to the number one lobby against what I do for a living? Yeah. It's so easy to not play there. Well, it's the prisoner's dilemma, right? And the reality is that like in this game, when people feel like they have value or have an edge or get an overlay, they're just willing to do whatever it takes, which is to the poker platform or the Venetian um, is to their benefit, right? I mean, what a joke mm-hmm. it was to have a tournament that basically a guaranteed prize pool that is the prize pool, right? That, yeah, I mean, that's so, that that's, really that's annoyed an, me. That's an obvious fuck you to the poker community. That's them saying, yeah. we know you'll come and it doesn't yeah. matter what we do. A- mm-hmm. And guess what? We came. Mm-hmm. I remember that, dude. Yeah, that was, uh, that was ruth- ruthless. And like, it might be, like, I don't want to be preaching here, right? I don't because there's an element of being really a, in a privileged position to be able to say no to this sort of stuff, right? If life is tougher, then the dollar is more important. So I'm not trying to say like, Hey, if you're in a spot, you got to do what you got to do. But if you're not in a spot, like why not just choose the integrity choice and like play somewhere else, like play at the Aria, dude, you know, like what, what are you going to lose $5 in equity? Like whatever, you know, like just go there, play at the win. Yeah. But I don't know. He's dead now. So maybe I have to revisit that. Things are different. Yeah. I might play there one day. We'll see. Maybe one day you'll you'll be there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anything to get out of the cold, frigid tundra that you're in right now. Dude. Send me to yeah. the desert. <laughs> Brad, I don't know where to draw the line on that sort of stuff, though. And honestly, I've been thinking about it a lot of my life because um, I, it's just, I'm curious how you navigate that. Because things happen. You've got a feeling. You've got a thought on something. <laughs> How, how much does it matter? How much do you care? To me, it seems completely arbitrary. It seems it like I can just choose what to care about, what not to care about, and how much. And I don't have a guide on what that answer should be. It's like I'm making it up as I go. Right. So I, there, there is no answer here. I think it's, to me, I went through this phase of like all of the all of the causes in the world, right? Like, okay, clothes that are not made in Bangladesh, right? Because folks that right. live in Bangladesh, you know, um, they, they often walk six miles to work and six miles back and work like 150 hours a week. I don't, are there even 150 hours in a week? I don't even know. But basically they're spending all their time making clothes so mm-hmm. that we can buy them cheaply. And by the age of, um, you know, their mid thirties or early thirties, they're done physically. They can't do it anymore, right? Those, they get fired, they get let go, they get sent back to their families and they're just kind of broken people. And so when you buy clothes from Bangladesh, you know, I realize like, oh shit, like I'm supporting this, you know, by getting my clothes for half off or whatever. And so like there was a long time where I paid very close attention to um, the tags. And then there's like uh, living conditions and working conditions in like China with various electronic equipment, just various 
items across the board. There's um, the cause of, you know, factory farms and mm -hmm. the way that animals are treated and like bred and just very deeply unhappy. And just, it, it was this thing of like, whenever I could find any kind of silent suffering, I went out of my way to avoid that thing. Um, and you quickly realize that like, it's hard to be a member of society and avoid all forms of silent suffering, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately it was just, I'm going to do the best that I can and not actively partake and try to educate myself, but I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to screw up just because I can't know everything about everything. And then just kind of, you know, let the chips fall where they, they may and forgive myself uh, and just say, you're doing your best and just kind of move forward, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's a great way of approaching it, right? And it, and it resolves that question in terms of what, what it is that you pay attention to. Because mm -hmm. um, there is no answer. But I, I think one that troubles me is, you know, let's say you're talking with a friend from your hometown or whatever, right? And they say something in a conversation that, like, doesn't fly, you know, it's not okay anymore. When do you step in? Right. Basically, you have to make a decision in terms of who do you want to be as a person? Do you want to be the let it slide guy or do you want to be the stickler that is less enjoyable? Yeah. And uh, I have no idea, Brad. I have no idea where to draw that line. I don't. It's the same line as the Venetian. Is it unreasonable? I'm not sure. I don't know. I I'm lost. <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest. This, this I'm is taking lost. Yeah, this is taking a turn. Um, so for me, I try, I will try to educate when, if I think the communication is not going to lead to immediate conflict mm. and otherwise I just don't say anything. If somebody has behavior and takes actions that I know is going to be a fight, if I say something then I just tend to not say anything. But then I also choose who I associate with in the future as well. So mm -hmm. in that way, you know, I have just kind of stopped calling people and stopped maintaining relationships or friendships with people who just like aren't growing, that aren't learning, that don't seem to care about their fellow man or any of these things. Then like it's my choice who I want to hang out with. And so I just kind of move on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think creating a big fight in a big situation just doesn't really do any good because people don't argue well. And the way that most people kind of argue and have discussions is they just want to prove their side. So yeah, right. at, at all, at all costs, they want to prove that they're right. So there's no, there's not even a, a rational discussion to be had. So, you know, in that way, I just kind of let things go and then make my decision afterwards. I also say too, like on, on like a much lesser degree, I let things go better than I ever have before. If somebody says something that I know is like factually incorrect, I just, I don't correct people anymore. I just mm. like let them say the thing and move on because it drives me absolutely batshit crazy. If like I misspeak or people are trying to find some like, avenue to disprove something just because they think that they're clever or smart um on mm -hmm. the internet especially poker twitter is like the perfect example of that mm -hmm. like yeah. yeah um oh well what if this happens then then you're wrong ha 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 i gotcha um it's like dude go fuck off like <laughs> just <laughs> leave me alone i don't need that person in my in my space but yeah it's yeah. a tough question yeah. and i mean i would say oh i mean if something is done to offend another human being, then I think it's different where somebody is act actually affected in the moment by some idiot saying something that mm. obviously is like out of bounds. Then I think there is correction that's needed there just for the sake of the human being who's uh, for whatever reason, just like close by or near or the cause of their angst or whatever it is. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, some good, some good thoughts on that. I mean, there's, 
that it troubles me, Brad. It troubles me. I think about it quite a bit. And uh, yeah, still very uncertain in terms of how to, how to approach that sort of stuff with things like the Venetian, with, with things in poker, uh, just generally. So Yeah. The, the question for me is like, do I know the owner of the Aria? Do we know that they're, they haven't done some atrocious no, things, not. right? Like we, we, don't, yeah. we don't really know what anybody who owns a casino has done in their life. I mean, things come out about Steve Wynn, right? Like these mm-hmm. are, and it's like, what do you do? I, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't have the answer and I don't want to live in complete ignorance, but I also want to do stuff. And like, yeah, yeah, not be like, like, uh, totally trapped in your own world. Right. Like, I can't like, do anything. Yeah. I, I live like, here. That's it. <laughs> build my own city, um, exactly. free, free of all suffering. I guess that's, that's a, an alternative. But yeah, I mean, it, it's tough questions. And I think that, like, honestly, I, I've come to, it's caused great depression. I think the amount of suffering and especially silent suffering that exists in the world has felt at times like, a, a weight just on me and because you feel small and the challenge seems just so immense. You can't even really visualize it. You can't comprehend how hard overcoming these difficulties are. And I've just kind of come to the conclusion that I just do the best that I can as a human. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of all I can do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I had, I had a discussion with another poker player about that in terms of, like how, how much selfishness is reasonable if we mm-hmm. assume that being here on this planet, some amount of like advocating for yourself as opposed to others is reasonable. And some people say all of it, you know, like, oh yeah, just do everything for yourself, Max. I, I feel as if there should be some share of the pie, you know, like if you are incredibly fortunate or incredibly wealthy or lucky or whatever it is that you perhaps share some of that is, well, is a good approach. And yeah, I mean, how much, you know, like where? I mean, and, you do what you can. Like, this is a thing I struggle with this too in poker because like it, it's obviously a game where the goal is to beat other people and take mm-hmm. their money, right? Like yeah, this yeah, is like yeah. literally the goal of poker, right? Um, and you have these sort of existential crises of what am I giving to the world and what am I doing? You know, it's just like really my purpose is just to beat people out of money. Um, and I think over time I've learned that there's a lot more that goes into it. I think, first of all, if somebody's like a loser at a poker tournament or even in a cash game and they enjoy being there and it gives them a break from their life and it's an activity that like they just love doing, even though they're losing money, then having access to that activity is a good thing. Um, having good conversations, the experience, all those things I think can be good. And also like, you know, as poker players, it's not as if we have to win all the money and we're not allowed to help people with that money. Right. <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. You, you know, we can give back, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Like we can, it doesn't have to be max exploit at all times and everything. <laughs> right. <know>? Like <laughs> yeah. you, you can like win money and then uh, use that money to help a good cause. Right. Mm-hmm. There, there's nothing that like against that. And a lot of poker players have, and it has given that level of fulfillment. So I would say that like, if you're listening right now as a poker player and you're, wondering what am I doing? What am I giving back? Like realize you can go buy a pizza for a homeless person right now and go give them a meal. Like you can help people. There's nothing that is stopping you um, other than like, you know, our own kind of laziness and really our our own uh, egos that think of us and only us 24 hours a day. Yep. Not here's, here's a crazy one. And I've talked to some players that play in like, private cash games and high stakes cash games. You can even let off the gas in poker sometimes. And I never hold it against people to be pedal to the metal because I think in competitive play, you go all the way. But if you're playing and, you know, you, you see someone and like they're having a tough night or something, like sizing down your value bet, bro, you can do that. Like that's allowed in the rules of society that like you can show compassion even in the battle of our game that we study and we learn. You can, you can do that. I mean, you got to, of course, abide by the rules, tournament rules, like no, no soft playing, et cetera. But uh, I hear about that in, in high stakes private games. The great poker player, of course, gives action, lets off the gas, like lets people, you know, allows people to have wins and, and, and good moments. Like that's, 
that's part of having a good experience. If they're not having a good experience, then they're out, bro. Like they're well, not gonna play. And it's know? just, you know, not kicking people when they're down. I think yeah. it's like high high stakes poker players, very high level poker players have in general extremely high levels of empathy. And so like we can feel that, you know, you can feel somebody's energy when it is just they're just toast. And and like yeah. having compassion is okay, even in the poker space. I mean, one of my I have a memory of being probably I don't know how old I was, maybe 24 or 25, and playing on absolute poker. And I was playing heads up, and this kid bought in and like we were battling, and he was like chatting to me. And I told him, like, dude, and clearly having a bad time of it. I'm like, dude, just quit. You know, like I'm going to I'm gonna bust you. Like that's the end result of this. Mm. Just log off. Like close the close your account, log off. Um, he didn't log off and we battled and I did bust him. Um, which ultimately, you know, I, I remember that story. I wish there was a, a happy ending, but there's no happy ending. He didn't leave. I did bust mm -hmm. him. I tried to warn him. I did what I could. Um, and then he asked for his money back. Like after we got done and I was like, sorry, man, like you had an opportunity to mm -hmm. quit, but you didn't. And like, this is the consequence, but yeah, there is room for compassion in poker. And I think it's just, we oftentimes over prioritize our bottom line, but under prioritize our soul and our spirit and mm. doing things that are satisfying to our soul and our spirit um, are very impactful. And there are lots of long-term gains to regularly doing such things. Absolutely. I a hundred percent, I a hundred percent agree with that. Um, when it comes to the money stuff to like the, the wealth, accumulation in poker and stuff like that. I, I mean, something that I've come to think about is what I didn't want to do is be in this state of flux and feel like an element of shame, right? You know, like where you're, you always feel as if the more successful you get, the more you question as to whether you're living your, your, your life like justly or fairly or ethically or whatever. So I've kind of come up with this idea of, of sort of like a personal expenditure cap that to me is like a, a level of, of selfishness in the world, you know, that I, that I'm okay with. And then beyond that, I'm not okay with it anymore. So I kind of like drew a line, an arbitrary line in the sand. It's really freed me up to, to have some, you know, some clarity in that aspect of my life in terms of sure, go ahead and like maximize the EV. But like, if you get to this point, you know, you're, you're not going to anymore or you're going to stop accumulating basically for the sake of accumulating. Um, how has that been freeing for you? Like, how does it, how did it release weight? Well, I don't know, man, like, like people in Bangladesh live on $3 a day. Yeah. Like we can, we can just not think about that and, and go ahead and live our lives and buy the, the new iPhone, right. That I have right here. But like, also you could, probably spend a thousand dollars and like save an actual human life. And so it's only ignorance. Like you can just be ignorant to that and you can go on and you exist. But to me, that seems like a kind of cowardly way to go about being here and sort of just confront the ugliness of the world, confront the elements of selfishness that people have as individuals and recognize that like part of living is this risk element, is this chance element of the, the deck you've been dealt and the ability to transcend where you're dealt and improve your position from there. Like part of the value of life is that experience of making the most of where you are. Um, and some people, but then at a certain point it gets to be too much, you know, yeah. like Bezos, Bezos yacht is, you know, uh, like $500 million or something like that. Like his boat. That's a pretty easy example of like, he earned that money. He built the most successful company in the world, but like that could have literally saved like thousands of people's lives. I find that unethical. I'm not saying put rules in place to where he can earn that money. I'm just saying like, if that was me, I'd feel really terrible about myself making that decision. So I kind of just, I wanted to frame my own reference for how I was going to navigate that financial part of my life. So I could just operate and like, don't beat myself up if I made a bunch of money and I spent it on myself to feel okay about it. 
Yeah. Um, it's you know, really smart. Like that, that was the yeah. idea. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And I think it's it's quite smart. And um, yeah, I think I, I was, I thought about this a while ago of like, at what point is like infinite money enough? I don't know. Like, is mm, there yeah, a point yeah. of like where a hundred billion like gets you more than 10 billion, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, we, we kind of went, yeah, we, we went, I think to an important place. Uh, and these are all important topics. I, I think that human beings should just think about it in general, because like you mentioned just like where you're born, the hand that you're dealt. There are a lot of folks and souls in the world that are dealt not great hands that mm-hmm. stand very little chance. And the reality is that like pe- folks like you and I have clearly been dealt decent hands. Um, otherwise, yeah. we probably- Great handies even. Great hands. Crushing it, Brad. <laughs> crushing it, right? So, so yeah, it, it's, it's always easy to like look up at what you don't have and what where there is to go without looking down um, at what you've accomplished and what you've done and then giving back to folks who yeah just haven't had as much opportunity or access or any of these things you know a, as you have mm-hmm. um, I I have a like a thi- like a a math thing that I thought of in my head that really spurred this on right and it's the lottery thing okay so it's mm-hmm. like if someone Let's let's say that someone's personal like wealth cap in this system that I've devised, and for some people it could be a hundred million. Some people it could be half a million, right? Let's say it's ten million for some person. They decide that's they're okay, and anything over that, like they're not gonna take. So someone wins the lottery for eleven million dollars. Like, how much of that do you think they're they're gonna donate or give away to other causes or like things that are, are utilized? I think a high percentage of the world would give away at least a million of that 11 million. Like most of the world, I think would probably do that. Someone wins the lottery for a hundred million. How many are going to give away 80, $90 million? Like almost none, like almost 0%. Mm -hmm. And the actual utility increase as an individual is small, but obviously that's a nine X difference, you know? So preventing that, like if one of these companies I'm working with hits the moon, and I, you know, I bank the next Facebook or something or the next esports superstar. Uh, having that in place prevents the lifestyle creep where you just give a percentage. Yeah. You know? Like yeah, that, that, makes that sense. math seems broken with the the billionaires and the and the hundred fifty millionaires. Like the reality like is if there. The reality is, you know, and I I've been, I've been friends with, you know, a billionaire in it's not even as if the billions made him fundamentally happy or satisfied. You know, Mm-mm. it was always more ambition and always wanting more, and it actually a deep sense of unhappiness because they, you know, he didn't know who actually wanted to be in his circle because they liked him as a human being, right? Because he always had, um, yeah, people always needed money or resources or connections or whatever it was. So, like. Right. Even at that point, like there, there wasn't fulfillment, right? Like there wasn't this deep sense of happiness, and, and yeah. So anyway, I, I don't know exactly where I'm going with that, but it's just like the chase of endless wealth and resources doesn't necessarily end in some sort of fulfillment or in-game happiness. And ultimately, we're human beings; we're a part of the human race, and I think helping our fellow man is the number one thing that we can do to give us fulfillment and joy. Yeah, I agree, man. No, I'm uh, same page. It's like, it's really nice to not have survival needs, you know, not have food, shelter, clothing needs. But then when you have that, uh, I feel as if the problems are pretty similar, you know, once you have that health, food, shelter, clothing down net, net worth 300 K and net worth 30 million, I feel like probably have similar problems. Uh, at that point, I could be wrong, but um, they're definitely they're billionaire problems. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're, they're, they're rich t- people problems for sure. But you know, it's <laughs> like there's fulfillment problems for billionaires where they're unhappy. I have no doubt in my mind that some billionaires are unhappy. It doesn't. Well, I, 
surprise me in the slightest. Yeah, I think the system that humanity's kind of built on is obviously flawed because of what just because of the way that the world works, I, I think. Mm. And like I don't know of a better way, but maybe there is somebody that does come up with a better way eventually that um is just very obvious and means that all humans have a better chance of living a happy life and have shelter, clothing, food, clean water, all of these mm -hmm. things. Um, but uh, on this giant positive note here uh, of the, the podcast, um, <laughs> <laughs> now that everybody is just not totally depressed and sad, uh, <laughs> Um, I'll ask, uh, you know, a couple questions here on the template. We can wrap up and, um, connect again, you know, in the near future. Cause it's always pleasure having you on the show and having these, these great conversations that, you know, not always are specifically about poker, but should matter to anybody who loves poker and doesn't love poker, you know? Mm. Sounds good, man. Um, have you ever strongly believed something about poker only to change your mind later on and if so what led to that change i mean very functional in 2000 uh when was black friday 2011 right or 2009 april 15th 2011 <laughs> 2011 yeah. yeah okay so i mean 2009 2010 2011 2012 uh, MTT poker sort of like figured out the math on shoving, or at least it became popular to where people were like, oh, okay, so you can just pick up like ace 10 and you can shove the button and it's this profitable because we can calculate this and this and therefore we shove. So like we figured out how to measure and therefore we put everything into the measurement and figured out what was profitable and we just did that. But no one asked the question of, is another line more profitable? So my process for playing poker back then, it was, is this a profitable shove? And the answer was yes, I would do it. Now, as I've evolved, there's comparison involved, which is, is raise folding more profitable? Is raise calling more profitable? Is, is limping more profitable? Limping more profitable, absolutely. Uh, and how do I want to balance my lines so that each of those has some raise folds and some raise calls and some et cetera? You yeah. know, uh, some limp raises, some limp calls, some limp folds. So yeah. that's changed. It's not about whether something's profitable. It's whether something's the most profitable line. Absolutely. And this was, somebody asked this question in bootcamp a while back where there was a spot, I believe, where you flat kings in position. And they asked the question of like, why is it not profitable to just five bet jam kings? And I was like, of course it's profitable. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> there, There's not a world where that's not profitable. But the question is like, what's the most profitable thing to do, right? Like there's a, that the saying in chess that like, when you find a good move, look for a better move. And I think that like, this is something that should always be at the forefront of poker players' minds is like, well, you found a good move. You played the hand well, was there a better move possible? Can you find something else? And I think it's easy to get lazy and complacent and just be like, yeah, it makes money. So I did it without ever right. asking, you know, the follow-up question. Yep. Absolutely. Um, what's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? I got a few, man. Uh, I'm not really ready to announce any of them, but one of them is in the uh, NFT space. And I don't want everyone's alarm bells to go off because NFT space does not have a particularly the great name with a yeah. lot of people right sure, now. Sure, Jamie, you only want X, <laughs> X number of dollars, but it's please not... buy, buy this NFT that I have <laughs> it's of my not... dog. It's not a pro it's not a 10,000 JPEGs project. It's actually a platform and I'm not totally ready to sort of talk about it yet, but the idea is sort of uh, taking some of the things that we hold near and dear on the internet and providing them a bit of a frame and a bit of a history and allowing the people that created those things to, to mint them and, and people that are fans of that stuff to collect it and stuff. So uh, I've been working on that for about a year. It'll be coming out this year. Um, and excited about it, you know, celebrating stuff that a lot of people already like on the internet. So, yeah, there you go. Um, you heard it here first, 
Jamie Staples True. going JPEG NFT <laughs> bonanza. Um, we have him with the beard, without the beard, no beanie, with the beanie. <laughs> <laughs> glasses on, glasses off. Um, yeah, I don't all think combinations. there will be any NFTs that I I own. Maybe I'll mint some of my own, but probably not. Probably won't. I'm just I want to empower other people too. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, to to close, you know. Final question is if, if the CPG audience wants to learn more about you and, you know, the projects that you're working on that are near and dear to your heart, where should they go on the World Wide Web? Thanks for having me on. Uh, Jamie Staples uh, is my name. I am Poker Staples for all poker content. You can search Poker Staples on any platform. I'm there and there's poker content coming out. So Twitch is my main YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter. TikTok? You're in TikTok the TikTok follow. game? Gotta be on the TikTok game. You have to be. Uh-oh. Um, and then Jamie Staples is where I have like personal accounts. So Jamie Staples on Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. And I talk about things that usually aren't poker on those accounts. And yeah, it was a pleasure. And it was, it was a lot of fun. It was always great to talk to you and, and, uh, and riffing on some ideas, poker and otherwise. Yes, sir. Always good having you. And we got a lot of stuff to talk about, you know, in the next year or so. Come back on for round three. Excited to hear more about NFT project. And yeah, just actually dealing with some of these like bigger issues that are have a lot of scope. And yeah, happy to see where you go um, on all of those things. Cheers, man. Yep. Thanks for having me on, Brad. Peace out. Thanks for listening to Chasing Poker Greatness. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com to get the newsletter. Join the Greatness Village community, book a coaching session, or dive into the latest data-driven poker courses. Follow the show on Twitter at CPG Podcast.